Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special occasion um, when we inaugurate uh, a new event, and particularly to such a wonderful person as uh, Rabbi Marshall Meyer. Uh, it's really a special occasion for us uh, at Dartmouth and particularly at the Dickey Center. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. And I'm very, very glad to welcome you uh, to uh, the inaugural uh, event. Uh, it's the, it will be the annual Rabbi Marshall Meyer Great Issues Lecture on Social Justice. And uh, in a, just a little bit of time, uh, we'll be introducing uh, our speaker, Ambassador Hector Timmerman, but I wanted to welcome him. But there are a few sort of introductory remarks that uh, I wanted to make before we actually uh, begin the program. Um, as I said, the uh, Marshall, Rabbi Marshall Meyer Great Issue Lecture on Social Justice will be an annual Dickey Center event, and it is made possible by a very generous contribution, a gift from Andrew Lewin of the class of 1981, his wife Marina, their son Josh is here today, and also other members of their family. Uh, but I would just like if the three of them could just stand up for a moment and be recognized. I would be very appreciative. <laughs> Now, as I said, uh, this lecture uh, will be an annual event, uh, you know, sponsored by the Dickey Center, but uh, we are working very, very closely um, with the Jewish Studies Program and also the Tucker Foundation uh, in, in planning this event and also uh, choosing uh, the speakers. And I just wanted to mention that, uh, that, that there is a committee of three individuals uh, who are responsible for choosing uh, the speakers. And that committee is comprised of Professor uh, Susanna Heschel, who I will be introducing formally uh, in just a moment, uh, and also uh, the chaplain of Dartmouth College, uh, Dr. Richard Crocker. And I want to thank you know, both of them, and also to uh, Dean Stuart Lord, uh, who is here of the Tucker Foundation for the wonderful uh, cooperation uh, and, and uh, just good goodwill in, in, in putting this program together. Um, just a word now about uh, the Great Issues series of lectures. Um, this is a series of lectures that we instituted three years ago at the Dickey Center, and they are designed to commemorate John Dickey's conviction uh, embodied in the Great Issues course that I'm sure uh, some of you probably attended, some of the Dartmouth alums in the audience. This was a course taught at the college uh, during John Sloan Dickey's presidency, uh, and, and it was a very integral part of his belief that an important part of a Dartmouth education is, a, is acquiring competence in civic engagement and responsibility. And there is this wonderful quotation which we use so frequently, uh, the world's troubles are your troubles, he told Dartmouth students at convocation in 1946. And there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. And that sentiment, uh, those very wise words, uh, very much uh, direct and, and, and guide what we are doing today. I did want to spend a minute or two, though, and just discuss a, a broader issue, and that is the connection uh, between international understanding, international affairs, and social justice. Uh, it may not be apparent uh, to everyone at, at first glance. And let me just you know, say the following. On the face of it, the issues of international affairs seem remote indeed from the problems of social justice. And yet, at the heart of many international issues is a social justice concern. If we understand social justice to embody a world in which all members of global society have the same basic rights, security, and opportunities, then indeed the great international scourges of our time and of all times, war, poverty, famine, and disease are also social justice issues. 
Inequities of power and resource distribution continue to lead to violent conflicts with war affecting disproportionately those in society who are weakest, children, women, and minority groups. Poverty is itself an affliction that, affect, that affects the people of the world disproportionately, and income inequity is replicated and reinforced in the international system. Poverty, furthermore, underpins global health challenges like malnutrition, AIDS, malaria, and HIV-AIDS. Solve the poverty problem, and these health crises become more manageable. Environmental damage, including uh, the spreading Sahara des desertification and pollution, often follow from resource and income inequities as the poor in society deforest and pollute their land for lack of resources that would give them more environmentally sound choices. This, in turn, makes their countries even poorer. The injustices that plague groups and societies can then be replicated, reinforced, and institutionalized at the level of the international system. To begin to understand the world, therefore, is also to recognize the causes and consequences of social inequity and injustice. I now have um, pleasure in introducing uh, two very special guests who are here today. Um, first, I would like to call on uh, Andrew Lewin of the class of 1981 for remarks. Andrew. Thank you, Ken. Marina and I wanted to provide a dialogue uh, at Dartmouth about tikkun olam, the Jewish sense of mission to repair the world through action, by supporting a social justice lecture in honor of Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who embodied that principle. He's someone we have always admired because of his moral courage and the force of his worldview. For Marshall Meyer, faith and struggle were synonymous. His religion was in no way theoretical. Because of his religious beliefs, like his great teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, he inevitably found himself confronting the world. Like the prophets, he was not willing to stand idly by, to remain indifferent, to ignore cruelty and inequality. For him, the Jewish response grounded in the prophets was dissent, action, and rejection of the status quo. For him, religion could not exist without a profound dedication to human rights and social justice. Marshall Meyer was a product of the Dartmouth of John Sloan Dickey. Dickey felt that Dartmouth needed to make a commitment to moral and spiritual growth, an integral part of its education, and he created the Tucker Foundation in 1951 to promote that end. He wanted Dartmouth students to put the advantages they received in service to others. I believe that both John Sloan Dickey and Marshall Meyer would be pleased with the way Dartmouth today embodies this ideal. They would be pleased that the Princeton Review has singled Dartmouth out as a college of conscience, that over 70 percent of Dartmouth students today volunteer in service to others, that Dartmouth has earned the top rank in the number of Peace Corps volunteers in the small college category. The John Sloan Dickey Center, the Tucker Foundation, and Jewish Studies will be cooperating on this lecture series going forward, which has the aim of transmitting Marshall Meyer's belief in the prophetic call to root out injustice to the current Dartmouth community. Our hope is that it will convey his powerful message that we are called upon to liberate the oppressed, dress the naked, feed the starving, and fight for justice. We're very pleased that Naomi Meyer and Eric Meyer, members of Marshall's family, could be with us today. Thank you. It's a very special privilege to introduce uh, the next speaker. Um, she is the person who shared 
Um, many years with Marshall Meyer, Rabbi Meyer shared his work, shared his ideals, his enthusiasm, his, his great love of social justice. Um, one of the great pleasures of being involved in, in this annual lecture has been the opportunity uh, to meet and to get to know uh, Naomi Meyer. And uh, I think when she speaks, and you will hear later about uh, Marshall, the wonderful things that he did, uh, you will see that, that uh, two very, very wonderful people are being honored. Naomi, please come to the podium. <clears throat> When people ask me to speak, they think they're going to hear some family secrets, but I'm not going to tell you any. <laughs> uh, Marshall gave a lecture here when he was a Montgomery Fellow, uh, and he's, before he spoke, as Jewish custom is, he wanted to say something. And what he said, how wonderful and how privileged the people are to be part of the Dartmouth community, that one of the big formations in his life, the most important formation in his life, was being a Dartmouth student. And he carried that through his life. Uh, he was participated in a book that was published by Dartmouth about mentors, where he spoke about Pat Scott Craig. Uh, and uh, we went to Argentina shortly after, well, not so shortly, several years after he graduated. And any, many Argentine kids, if you ask them now, can sing Dartmouth songs with a Spanish accent. We had a summer camp, and that's what they would do. Uh, Marshall was always dressed in green, of course. I wanted, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I wanted to thank Ken Yalowitz, uh, Dickie Center, Stuart Lord from the Tucker Foundation, and Susanna Heschel, my dear friend from Jewish Studies. And I must say that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to connect, although we're always connected, Susan, because the great influence in Marshall's life was Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, Susanna Heschel's father. Uh, I don't think he ever started anything or said anything or taught a class without talking about Dr. Heschel. And of course, to Ken and Marina Yalowitz, it, not only your generosity in, in giving this endowment, but also the content of it is really special. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not that into academic life or college life, but I believe it's probably one of the few people that give an endowment with such a wonderful content. I wanted to just take a minute of your time. Um, Marshall, of course, thought his ministry or his rabbinate was about social justice. And when people asked him, why are you being political in Argentina, he said, this is not politics. This is what I must do as a rabbi. And if a rabbi does, doesn't activate and become involved in what's going on around him, then he's not a rabbi. And let me just one minute, just read something, the selection from what Marshall said. As a rabbi, I felt obliged, he's talking about our time in Argentina under the military. As a rabbi, I felt obliged to visit prisons and to com try to comfort parents of the disappeared people, be they Christian, Jew, or agnostic. Why? Be behind what little I have done in human rights, such an endless task. There was and is one basic idea. If we are to take the prophet seriously, we cannot negate history and return to a golden ghetto. I have tried to respond to life in this jungle as I believe, I believe a rabbi should respond. The problems are ours because Amos, Isaiah, and Hosea taught us that they are ours, taught us that there is only one mankind as there is only one God. And this is the basis of liberation theology. Why should so few have so much and so many starve? This is a Jewish question. This is a biblical question. I bleed with people when I see them hungry and crawling for safety. So this was, he felt this was his religious mission. And I'm really, again, happy to, to Andy and to um, Marina. Dick of, Dickey Foundation, the Tucker Foundation, and the Jewish Studies. I'm happy that my nephew, Marshall's nephew, Eric Myers, class of 62, is here, and delighted that my ambassador, Hector Timmerman, is here. Thank you.
Yeah, I too wanted just to um, recognize Professor Eric Myers, who's here from Duke University, uh, a nephew of uh, Rabbi and um, Naomi uh, Myers. Please stand. We recognize. <laughs> I think now you can see why we're so proud that, uh, that we're going to have this annual lecture uh, in the name of Rabbi Meyer. This is a wonderful, wonderful gift to Dartmouth. Uh, now to introduce um, our speaker formally, um, I'd like to call on uh, my good friend, Professor Susanna Heschel, uh, the Eli Black Associate Professor of Jewish Studies uh, and the Department of Religion here at Dartmouth and a dynamo who organizes some incredibly terrific conferences here. Susanna. Thank you very much. Today's lectureship is honoring an extraordinary person. And Dartmouth takes great pride in having helped to shape his life. Marshall Meyer was a brilliant, enthusiastic undergraduate here. He had a wide range of interests in music and philosophy and in sports and in opera, but most important, in religion. As a religion major, he was deeply influenced by the founder of that department, Professor Fred Berthold. Stand up. Stand up. Professor Berthold is one of Dartmouth's most distinguished and beloved faculty members. He's influenced innumerable students for many years, guiding them in their own paths with his wisdom, his gentleness, and also with his penetrating questions. Marshall had thought of many careers, but Fred recognized, even before Marshall did, I think, that Marshall had a calling to the rabbinate. Fred put Marshall in touch with his good friend, my father, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who encouraged Marshall and also promised to tutor him in Talmud so that he would be admitted to the Jewish Theological Seminary since he didn't have the Talmud training. Talmud was not offered as a course at Dartmouth at the time. <laughs> Their friendship led to further momentous developments. My father went to South America in 1958 to give a series of lectures, and when he returned, he told his students that there was a great need for rabbis there. And so Marshall, who was just graduating, and his wife, Naomi, took up the challenge and spent the next 22 years in Argentina. And it's wonderful that Naomi is here today and also that Eric Myers, Marshall, and Naomi's nephew, class of 62, is a professor of religion and a very distinguished biblical archaeologist who has also graced our campus with lectures in the past, is also with us on this occasion. I have to tell you that Marshall transformed Jewish life throughout the Spanish-speaking world. He established a major conservative synagogue in Buenos Aires. He established a Jewish day school, a Jewish summer camp, and a rabbinical school. He arranged to have major works of modern Jewish thought translated and published in Spanish. He inspired dozens of young people to become rabbis. And it is, in fact, Marshall's protégés who were at the forefront wherever there is a revival of Jewish life today in South America, in Mexico, in the United States, in Europe, and in Israel. In 1985, Marshall returned to the United States and became rabbi of an old and distinguished but dying conservative congregation on the Upper West Side of New York. He transformed congregation B'nai Yishurin into the most vital synagogue in America, perhaps in the world. It's become a model for community life, for religious commitment to social activism, political engagement, but also an example for achieving true devotion in prayer. Many awards were bestowed on Marshall. He was given the Order of the Liberator San Martin, the highest honor that Argentina can bestow on a non-citizen. He received honorary doctorates at Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Theological Seminary, Kalamazoo College, and also at Dartmouth, where he was a Montgomery Fellow in 1981, among many other honors. But I think I would say that it's not only the honors that he received as, as doctorates, for example, from distinguished institutions, but what he gave to us as Jews, but as all human beings, what he gave to our hearts and to our spirits, the way he enlivened us and engaged us and brought us to life politically and religiously and set us on fire. That's who Marshall was. He was an extraordinary person. And it's a wonderful, wonderful tribute to him that has been established with this lectureship by Andrew and Martina Lewin, and we thank you for that. 
We're going to begin now with a brief excerpt of about 10 minutes of a DVD that describes a bit about Marshall, and then we're going to hear from our speaker, Ambassador Hector Timmerman, and I will formally introduce him after we've seen this excerpt of the DVD. El premio Nobel de la Paz, Eli Wiesel, dijo una vez, la misión de un judío no es hacer el mundo más judío, sino más humano. Ese fue el sentimiento con el que vivió el rabino Marshall Meyer y la enseñanza que le dejó a sus discípulos y al mundo entero en los 25 años que permaneció en la Argentina y durante su estadía en los Estados Unidos, su tierra natal. I have no right to be silent in the face of injustice. I cannot believe to claim in, to believe in God and remain inactive when God's image is destroyed. According to the Muslim, Christian, and of course Jewish belief, we human beings are made in the image of God. And when humans are denigrated, humiliated, and persecuted, the sanctity of human life is threatened everywhere. And if there is no longer the sanctity of life, of human life, we lose our course in history and become less than human. Meyer llegó a la Argentina en 1959 para oficiar como segundo rabino en la Congregación Israelita de la República Argentina. El panorama que encontró era desolador. Las sinagogas se estaban quedando sin gente y los únicos que asistían a los servicios eran los ancianos. Las medidas que implementó le dieron nuevos aires a la comunidad y sirvieron para sentar las bases del movimiento conservador en el país. Introdujo los servicios juveniles, los campamentos de verano, los grupos para chicos, adolescentes y jóvenes. A su vez tradujo el Sidur al español, juntó a hombres y mujeres en los servicios religiosos e introdujo el órgano en la liturgia. Tantos cambios fueron difíciles de asimilar para una sinagoga tan tradicional. Por eso debió marcharse en 1963 para crear una nueva comunidad, Betel. Su sinagoga pronto se convirtió en el centro de atención de la comunidad judía, desde donde surgió un mensaje innovador que atraía a la gente. We have found that Jews will come to the synagogue and will begin to pray if a proper focus is made uh, and, and, and we address real issues. We don't implant issues. We don't assume that we have all the answers, but that we are questing for an element of sanctity. But I believe that the only way to build for tomorrow is a realistic approach to the problems of today. And there are great problems in Judaism and great problems in Jewish life. And they have to be addressed. And I think if one is honest enough to address these and not come with uh, platitudes and, and pat answers, but really agonize over the questions and agonize over the inequalities in Jewish life. Su aporte más importante a la vida judía fue la creación del Seminario Rabínico Latinoamericano en Buenos Aires en abril de 1962. 
Meyer tenía en claro que su mensaje debía fortalecerse formando rabinos educados con esa nueva visión del judaísmo. La visión de este seminario es, número uno, nadie puede ser un rabino eficaz sin ser graduado de la universidad y en casa con la cultura mundial, oriental, occidental, de todos los épocas. Número dos, no puede existir diferencias ni preferencias entre Ashkenaz y el Sephardí. Número tres, el compromiso con la sociedad actual es la única cosa que puede asegurar conjuntamente con un congruente mensaje con respecto a las tradiciones milenarias del pueblo judío, pero siempre con la necesidad de un exégesis moderno. Su labor académica se vio eclipsada por su lucha en favor de los derechos humanos durante la última dictadura militar en la Argentina. En esos años, Meyer recibió a las madres de los desaparecidos, visitó a los presos en las cárceles y fue la única voz de la comunidad judía que se alzó contra la masacre que se estaba llevando a cabo contra la población. Apart from the Rabbi Marshall Meyer, There were very few Jewish leaders who protested against uh, the butchery of many Jews or of or Christians or atheists or whatever. When I worked in Argentina in human rights, I never asked one of the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, or the disappeared, or the murdered. I hate the word disappeared. They weren't disappeared. They were made to disappear. They were tortured and killed. I never asked a woman who asked for help whether she was Jewish, or Catholic, or atheist, or communist, or whatever it was. She was a suffering human being. I act in human rights, and I act through all the role that I played in Argentina or against the military junta. I didn't do because of political things. I did it as, a, as a, an outcome of a direct religious commitment to Torah. And as a Jew, how could I turn my eye? Al tamor al damreyecha. You can't stand idly by while your brother bleeds to death. Cuando retornó la democracia en 1983. Su amigo, el presidente Raúl Alfonsín, lo invitó a participar de la Comisión Nacional para la Desaparición de Personas y lo condecoró con la Orden del General San Martín, la mayor distinción que se le da a un extranjero en la Argentina. A pesar de esto, Meyer decidió retornar a los Estados Unidos y se puso al frente de la congregación Bene Yeshurum, que por entonces no podía formar un minián. Allí comenzó a trabajar para los homeless y los enfermos de SIDA. Al poco tiempo, su sinagoga se tornó multitudinaria y vanguardista gracias a su infatigable labor. Meyer falleció el 29 de diciembre de 1993, víctima de un cáncer de hígado. Hasta el último día de su vida, siguió trabajando y transmitiendo su mensaje de esperanza al mundo entero. As Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel said, In a democratic society, not all are guilty, but indeed all are responsible. We are responsible for the sins of our society. And we all are involved in the sins of omission as well as commission. Shabbat Shalom. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Ambassador Hector Timmerman serves as Argentina's Consul General in New York and brings to this occasion a personal as well as a professional luster. A graduate of Columbia University's School of International Relations, he has worked as a consultant for political leaders and also as a distinguished writer for publications, several publications, including serving as editorial director of Latin American Finance, and as a consultant for public affairs analyst. Most important, he was a co-founder and is a board member of Human Rights Watch. Ambassador Timmerman's concern with human rights is enhanced by the ordeal of his family. His father, Jacobo Timmerman, was a very distinguished journalist in Argentina during the 1970s under the military junta. Bravely, he spoke out in his writing against the dictatorship and the extraordinary cruelties it was perpetrating. Thousands were killed, even more in prisons, and families usually had no idea of the whereabouts and fate of those who were arrested. They were, as they said, disappeared. 
Jacobo Timmerman was punished for his bravery with imprisonment, an experience he details in his 1981 memoir, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, an extraordinary book about government terror and personal courage that is certainly relevant today and that is dedicated to Rabbi Marshall Meyer. Jacobo Timmerman was one of many who survived his imprisonment in part thanks to Rabbi Meyer, who used to go from prison to prison locating the whereabouts of individuals. It was dangerous to show up at prisons demanding information, but Rabbi Meyer insisted that this was his obligation as a clergyman, as a Jew, as a human being. During the terrible years of military dictatorship, Rabbi Marshall Meyer was a sharp and loud critic of the regime. When the terrible years were over, he was appointed by President Alphonsine to the commission investigating the crimes that had been committed. He was the only foreigner to serve on that commission, and he worked tirelessly on it. What marked Marshall's life was his extraordinary commitment to the prophetic teachings of Judaism, to be religious is to be politically engaged. To speak in the name of God is to speak out against injustice and exploitation. Those who are deaf to the poor have not read the Bible. Those who plunder and exploit, cheat and imprison, their heart is false, says Hosea. All of us are indebted to Andrew Lewin, class of 1981, and Marina Lewin, for taking the initiative to establish this lectureship in memory of Rabbi Marshall Meyer. We're indebted too to Fred Berthold, who shaped him, and to Dartmouth College. We're also indebted to his family and to Naomi. This event will be annual at the Dickey Center, the Rabbi Marshall Meyer Great Issues Lecture in Social Justice. It's being supported by gifts from Mike and Rhea Gruss and by other members of Dartmouth alumni. Its intention is to bring to campus figures who inspire as well as educate with the hopes that all of us will follow the extraordinary example of Marshall Meyer and dedicate our lives as he did to acts of moral courage and spiritual audacity. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Hector Timmerman. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, let me clarify something from the beginning. This that I'm speaking is my English. So. <laughs> well, this is my first visit to Dartmouth, but I don't consider it a strange place. There is a feeling of deja vu, a coming back of familiarity due to the great affection that Rabbi Marshall Mayer felt for his alma mater, Dartmouth College. Countless times I heard Marshall speaking of his years here, of his friends, of the dreams and passions awakening in these halls. I knew Marshall Mayer, and I deeply admired him. I was his friend, and I can bear witness to the courage, the bravery, and the sacrifice with which Marshall faced each one of the struggles imposed by destiny. Those battles were not easy. But Marshall confronted them. He knew the risk, and he accepted them. The University of Dartmouth should be proud of having Marshall Mayer among its graduates. But regardless of the years and the battles we share, of those intense moments of true friendship that arise among men when they don't know if in the next hours one of them is going to be killed, I was never able to imagine what Marshall wanted to be when he used to walk along the wooded path of this beautiful corner of America. Marshall could have been a notorious intellectual, a distinguished professor, a renowned author, even a rabbi who introduced original interpretations to prophetic teachings. Marshall, on the contrary, was simply a militant a militant of life. That's how he described it right here at Dartmouth in 1991, two years before his death. He said, in the symphony of life, which plays the leitmotif of human dignity, I have no right 
to be silent in the face of injustice. I cannot claim to believe in God and remain inactive when God's image is destroyed. According to Muslim, Christian, and of course, Jewish belief, we human beings are made in the image of God. And when humans are denigrated, humiliated, and persecuted, the sanctity of human life is threatened everywhere. Being a militant means being responsible. There are moments in our lives when we cannot avoid confronting the unpleasant truth of our society. But if we do not deal with reality now, we are destined to confront the disasters that invariably follow our failure to act. Those were Rabbi Meyer's words here at Dartmouth. And these days, I cannot avoid wondering what would be Marshall's words about these present times in this country. He was committed to use all his strength in defending human rights, and he proved so in Argentina. In a way, his religion and his citizenship were two of his most powerful tools. As in many other cases of brave citizens, being American was also being alert in defending human rights everywhere these rights were violated, which reminds me of what is at stake now in the world. As you know, concentration camps, undisclosed detention centers, tortures against detainees, international coordination of illegal repression, were all ghosts against which he fought. I think it is important to be alert when you start to get familiar with these words. When you read them too often in the papers in the morning, when they become usual in the news at night. Those of us who have suffered different degrees of authoritarianism in our countries have developed a sort of sixth sense to detect those slippery domains. Today, as well as during Marshall's times in Argentina, having America on the side of human rights is not only a necessity for Americans, it is rather something that concerns to all of us. If America lose the leadership in this field, it's not a problem of one country, but a tragedy for the human rights movement all around the world. It is a powerful tool that people like Marshall today will not have when fighting dictatorships anywhere in the world. Marshall was a militant in Argentina in times when life was worthless. And at that time, he decided not only to give his life a meaning, but also dignify the lives of those who were persecuted, humiliated, denigrated, and forgotten. Those were terrible years. The price to oppose the establishment was either jail or death. Facing that terror, Marshall decided to become a militant. During those years, Marshall was one of the strongest voices defending life and human dignity. He did that in a country terrorized by an anti-Semitic, xenophobic, murderous army, always remembering and reminding everybody that he was acting as a Jew and a rabbi. His enemies called him the Red Rabbi, but he always said that the important thing was that his enemies never forget that he was a rabbi. And if we talk about working for the neediest and those who suffer, I cannot avoid today talking about immigration and the current debate in America. My duties as diplomatic representative of Argentina have put me in daily contact with the reality of thousands of people who have come to the United States looking for better living conditions, trying to obtain here the respect for the rights they couldn't obtain in their own countries, as working as hard as anyone to, ri to raise and build their families across borders. If there is something clear about the massive immigration who have arrived here is that they, more than anybody, are respectful and anxious to be part of the rule of law. Even more, it has been their desire of being subjects of the rule of law 
and beneficiaries of the same rule of law. What pushed them to cross the border once they realized that they don't want get that they don't want get that in their own countries. They don't want to be on the hide. They want to be with their legal papers in the open. They were not the scum of their countries, but people who have been forced to give up any hope in their own land. Illegality was never a haven for them, but the only available option. People get into complicated analysis about whether they should or should not carry the Mexican flag, or the American one. But the reality is that for the majority of them, there are no contradictions there. They want to be citizens, and they have wanted to be American citizens from the very moment that they decided to come here carrying the flag and the traditions and the ties of the countries they left behind. When one sees the problems they face every day, what becomes clear is that the debate is not about Mexico or America. The urgent question is to become citizen, to be able not to only to respect the law, but also to have it in their own defense. What can be more pro-rule of law than that? What can we expect from that desire other than citizens committed to enrich the public space, committed to participate in building the American democracy, committed to make the law their secular religion? There are more than 300,000 Argentinians living in the United States today. Most of them were forced to leave the country after it disappointed them, after they were betrayed, their jobs banished, their security put at risk, their money stolen by the very banks. We work intensively today so Argentina can be again a land where they want to live, a place to come back, but our efforts and support and work are also with those who remain here and deserve, deserve the opportunities that our parents had, either here or in Argentina. Going back to Marshall and the rule of law, I feel helpless and unable to explain the terrible moments we lived and the courage Marshall showed when facing those who violated every single right, especially the right to life. You should know this. No, I'm sorry. But, during those years, not even priests would dare enter in the prisons, even though such visits were permitted by the authorities. A rabbi, on the other hand, didn't have that right. Nevertheless, Marshall was one of the few priests and the only rabbi who wouldn't let a week pass without visiting the political prisoners. One day, a prisoner who was in the same prison where my father was detained asked him if it would be possible to speak with Marshall Mayer. He said, you know, Jacobo, you may be an atheist, but I am deeply Catholic, and my own priest is afraid of visiting me. The same priest that baptized me and my children and celebrated my marriage now would not even meet with my family. And I miss talking about God so much that I thought, I could do it with your rabbi. Marshall used to visit all of them. That's why my father's memoirs, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, are dedicated to Marshall Mayer with these words, a rabbi who brought solace, solace to Jewish, Christian, and atheist prisoners in Argentine jails. You should know the story of Deborah. Deborah is in itself the tragedy of my country. Once, when he was visiting the dungeons of Villa de, Villa de Boto, a very famous ter terror, ter terror, terror prison in Argentina, one of the prisoners told Marshall about a cell constantly closed, but through which door they could hear a girl crying. On his way out, Marshall pretended to be lost, walked toward that cell, and said out loud, I am Rabbi Marshall Mayer, if you want to talk to me, tell me your name. He heard the voice of a girl saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, my name is Deborah. Deborah's story tells us a lot about those years. She witnessed the army killing her 18-year-old brother and kidnapping her boyfriend. But she was lucky. And instead of killing her too, they sent her to prison. 
She was 16 years old. Marshall asked her if somebody ever visited her, but she said she didn't want to see anybody because every time her father was there to see her, she would have to, ha to get completely undressed and undergo a gynecological exam. So the militaries were sure she had not delivered nor received any subversive messages. And she said to Marshall, I am a virgin rabbi and I am really frightened to death. Marshall had to go through the horrendous moment to convince her that she should accept to be sexually molested in order to be able to see her family. Suddenly, her father stopped visiting her due to the threats he was receiving. So Marsha became her only contact with the outside world during the four years she spent in jail. What she didn't know, what Deborah didn't know, was that in order to be able to visit her, Marshall had to accept being undressed and examined, examined by the guards. 30 years later, Deborah still visited her boyfriend's parents, who in spite of everything, never found out why her only son is still missing. Within this context of terror, Marshall had to act facing the most dramatic, dangerous, and saddest situations the Argentinians had to endure. On one occasion, after hundreds of failed attempts to figure it out if my father was dead or alive, I finally got to be received by camps, number two in the investigation concerning the subversive. Camps was a general accused of committing the most the thousands of killings in Argentina. The most, he, killed, he was accused of killing more than 5,000 people, of being responsible for the killing of more than 5,000 people. This second of uh, General Camps is a character by the name of police chief Miguel Echecolás. After the end of the dictatorship, both Camps and Echecolás were brought to trial and condemned as directly responsible for the torture and execution of thousands of political prisoners. As you can imagine, I was terrified at the very thought of having to set foot at the police headquarters. I had heard of many that entered the place in order to renew their passports and were detained, kidnapped, and murdered. Of course, Marshall did not hesitate to enter with me into the belly of the beast. The police chief answered all my questions, denying that my father would be, as he really was, among his prisoners. Marshall stayed at my side in silence until finally he stood up and shouted, you have Mr. Timmerman and you cannot deny it any longer. The police chief held him in his sight in silence. I thought that we were going to be killed and I did not dare to speak. At one point, the chief, still staring at him disdainfully, asked him who he was. I am a shepherd, Marshall said in a clear and firm voice, who is looking for his sheep that you people robbed me. Again silence, fear of death, more silence until finally the chief of, of police started screaming. See, little shepherd, here for much less than what you just did, people vanish in thin air. This time I am going to forgive you but next time, before you come to my office, say goodbye to your family. Marshall lost many sheep, but he never gave up on any of them and carried on looking for them till the day he died. He went to the morgue with the parents of the desaparecidos looking for unclaimed corpse, visited hospitals and police stations asking after accident victims with the hope of finding out at least the truth about their fate. Marshall comforted the parents of the victims during long nights of terror while waiting with them for their children to come back. They never did, but sometimes it was the police that returned in order to worsen the ordeal of the dissident's family. Marshall Mayer never set aside his duty as a rabbi. And I remember when he taught us that the synagogue is the place where the one that is comfortable with himself 
had to feel uncomfortable. And the one who is uncomfortable with himself had to feel comfortable. Hundreds of times I took part in services in that synagogue. But only quite recently I realized the deep love that his parishioners had for Marshall. They risked dying in a bomb attack as the paramilitaries had threatened to carry on before ab abandoning, abandoning their rabbi, the red rabbi, as the fascists used to call him. Marshall dazzled us with a modern Judaism, a religious Judaism with social issues, a rabbi talking about sex, love, drugs, revolution. In a country of empty temples, his synagogue, Bethel, was full of people that did not see religion as something out of the past. Listening to Marshall Mayer, I realized that God was not dead. Marshall taught us to read the Bible, not just to recite it. He taught us to live the Judaism, to understand the message of the prophets, to be partners of God in the Tikkun Olam, to be partners of God in the construction of a better world and a more just society. As Marshall used to say, you cannot believe in God if you do not respect your neighbor. It is a necessary condition. We may talk about God all our life, but if we are not moved by the hungry children, the desaparecidos, or the, the jobless, what, is, what good is in them the affirmation of God? Being moved by the hungry children, the jobless, let me come back to, for a moment to what is going on today. Bolivia has just nationalized its natural resources. A country with conflicting history in the relation between the energy and the foreign companies has, once more, decided that the revenues of such resources should be managed by the country itself. What was hard to imagine 10 years ago is now a reality in one of the most impoverished countries with one of the most exploited people in the Western Hemisphere, a country where foreign powers and private interests have made enormous profits out of the rich resources of the country and at the cost of the lives of millions. Of course, there will be the fast food analysis in the following days, criticizing such an important resolution, pre-made ideas ready to fall on whoever makes a decision. I think that beside brave, today it is import it's also important to be patient with other people's experiences and with our own ignorance. We are living very interesting times in Latin America. Several countries are trying to creatively find new paths after several decades of impo impoverishment. The insertion of the region in the global economy is not a given, nor are the ways in which this is taking place. Governments that are trying to recover their sovereign power, but not to isolate their countries, not to subjugate their people, but to insert them in the best possible way in the global economy should deserve some credit. After so many years of violent persecution, those of us who survived have embarked in a peaceful revolution, one that should bring development and social justice, one that has to build a more equal society. We in Argentina hope that the people of the United States will side with the people of Latin America. There are many who regret that Marshall Mayer had not written down his thoughts and his philosophy in a book, a book that gave us answers to our uncertainties. And thank God he didn't. He busy himself stretching his hand to his neighbor, putting forward his body to defend the helpless, bringing the word of God to the dungeons, where a torturer, playing God, decided who was going to die and who was going to live. Instead of a book about philosophy, Marshall acted according to the precept, to the precept that commands us to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, protect the orphan, and deliver the persecuted. That is the way of God, and Marshall did not walk away from it. Instead of a the theolo theology book, Marshall founded in 1962 the first rabbinic seminar of Latin America. Its alumni become leaders of the Jewish communities in the region, bringing renewal to an agonizing and retrograde Judaism. Instead of a book of, on his ideas, Marshall introduced the most important Jewish philosophers of the century to the Spanish-speaking world. He was the editor of more than 70 books, 
among them the complete works of his mentor, Abraham Joshua Heschel, as well as the prayer books that are in use today in hundreds of synagogues and schools. Overall, Marshall not only thought and reflected about religion and his experience. More important, he worked hard for something that now is more crucial than ever, putting religion close to the people, harmonizing prey with the necessities of daily life, serving the community so religion is not only a relief for the thereafter, but a resource to improve living conditions here and now. In a country that is at war, in a country with millions below the poverty line, in a country where the social divide gets wider by the day, the religious leaders should know that there is no middle ground. Either you are with excluded or you are partners of the powerful minority. These people will pay a high price for it. I have seen it in Latin America and elsewhere. Empty churches and the indifference of their constituency toward religions that had turned their backs to the people. On the other hand, when I see today the commitment of different churches in the United States with the immigrants, the strong support they have offered to those in a weaker position, the networks mobilized by, those, by these churches to ensure the massive participation in the demonstrations of the last months, I see the same example that Marshall offered to us many decades ago. Marshall Mayer was true to his ideas to his mentors and to his religion. And particularly, he was true to Abraham Joshua Heschel. I shall never forget the first time that I heard his name. It was during 1977. I was a passionate political militant then, with many friends in prison, some dead and other desaparecidos, who thought that religion was at the very best just a means of comfort without any challenge. I remember that day because I spent many, many hours with Marshall Mayer waiting in front of the prison, hoping to visit my father. And while we were waiting, he told me that once Heschel said that when I walked, and he said, quoting Heschel, when I walked with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, Alabama, I felt that my feet were praying. That day, at Marshall's side, in front of the prison, I sensed that I was praying for the first time. When in 1983, the dictatorship was finally vanquished and the veil of silence of the, the atrocities were, was removed, people began to acknowledge Marshall's militant labor in defense of human rights. It was Raul Alfonsin, the first democratic president, who justly bestowed on Marshal Mayer the order of Libertador General San Martín. He was the only foreigner appointed as a member of the National Commission of Personas Desaparecidas, charged to gather evidence that was instrumental in bringing to trial the military responsible for the genocide. At that point in time, Marshall was already a legendary figure on his way to become a hero to a whole country. As I said at the beginning, I don't know what Marshall wanted to be when he was a college student, but I can certainly tell you that when I asked him why he put in danger his life and his families for a country that was not his and for a society that hadn't completely accepted him, he answered that his only aim was to follow Jean Paul Sartre's concept that in difficult times it's not important what the enemy do to us but what we do with what is left of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Ambassador Timmerman. Um, 
you were saying at lunch uh, that you had a few words and you didn't know, you know, how it was going to be. That was a, a very moving, a brilliant, and a very wonderful speech. And thank you very, very kindly. Uh, I know we have a few moments, and if you're able and willing, uh, I think we could probably take a few questions. Yeah, please, if you could come up. So if anybody has a question, please raise your hand, and um, I'd be glad, we'll be glad to. Uh, any questions? Sir. I'd be interested in your, you spoke of uh, uh, um, civil society in, in, in recent times in, in South America and the, the, the need for development in a, uh, a uh, framework of social justice. And uh, I travel often to Argentina and other countries and I'm, I'm really taken aback by by the level of corruption, and, and, and I, I don't, uh, I, I'm increasingly aware of it in this country as well, uh, and, and see this as a, almost a, a, a violation of, of human rights because it, 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 uh, it, it lowers the level of competency of government when you see how the government of, of the economy of Argentina imploded under uh, economic mismanagement uh, that had a lot to do with, with, with corrupt officials and bureaucrats shipping money overseas and, and favoring the, 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 the highest elements in, in society at the, mm -hmm. at the cost of the Lord. You, you, it, it, this becomes almost a human rights issue sure. uh, because it does plunge so many people into poverty. And I would like your thoughts and reflections on this and, and how to do it, what, what to do about this, because I, I think it also has a lot to do with the flow of, of, of immigrants out, out of uh, South America and into countries where, where they're looking for uh, Better, better government. Sure. Let, let, let me tell you first that this is a question made in a country where I have seen the army paying $17,000 for a hammer, and that is also corruption. Mm -hmm. Corruption is not something that happens only in the, other, in the underdeveloped countries. No? But let me tell you that Argentina or any other Latin American country has been managed for many, many years by corrupted military dictatorships in alliance with the establishment, with the aristocracy of that country. It was never the people who benefited from the corruption system. It was never the workers. They suffer the corruption. They are the ones who suffer. Now, we have to change that. But that is part of the, the big fight, because I always say that it was much more easier to try a general for committing a crime than to try a general for accepting a bribe. And the reason is that if you try the general for accepting a bribe, you have to try somebody for paying a bribe. And it's more difficult to go against the establishment in Argentina, the real holders of the power, than to go against the army. The army is like a Praetorian guards of these people. They are willing to sacrifice some of them, but not to sacrifice the system. It's not easy. Like, for instance, let me tell you that when Salvador Allende, who was one of the greatest leaders of Latin America, decided to nationalize the copper uh, mines, who were the, first, uh, the most important natural resource, and he, they make up the, the figures, they come out that they have taken so much money away from, Latin America, from Chile, the company, that it was really abuse. It was it completely, they were stealing the money there. But nevertheless, when they nationalized the, the copper mines, the ITT and the Anaconda company were able to convince Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon to overthrow the government of Chile. So corruption is more than just a guy paying a bribe. 
has to do with international relations, has to do with power, has to do with uh, who we want to run. If, a, if somebody was an anti-communist, he was a, the good guy for the United States. It's not simple to decide what is corruption, no? And how does it work, corruption? Uh, now, I guess that uh, after so many years of being in democratic societies, uh, we, are, we, were, we failed in we failed in, com in fighting against corruption. Most of the countries in Latin America still have corruption uh, among one of the most terrible things that we have to face. We have to eradicate that. It's not easy. It's not easy because the power, you don't win, election, you don't win the power by winning an election. Winning an election is a tool to gain power, but uh, the power in Latin America is still not in the hands of the people. It is still in the hands of multinational corporations, it's still in the hands of a local aristocracy, still in the hands of the uh, right-wing church. I mean, it's not uh, so easy like the, we, we won an election two years ago, now we are going to eradicate corruption. It will take decades, and it, will, it is part of an ongoing struggle against superpowers, against local uh, bankers, who, who work for, inter for instance, the Citibank is the largest bank who is, you are talking about sending money outside, away from Argentina. We have taped, we have taped officers from Citibank offering Argentinians to take money away from Argentina illegally. The, the US Congress had a series of, uh, of uh, meetings where people, bankers from Citibank, Chase Manhattan, were interviewed, and they were accused of being helping Argentinians and other Latin American countries to take away money, but they were never punished here. It is not a crime here, that. Now, it is not a crime here. It's very difficult for us to fight. There are $160 billion of Argentinians in American banks. Americans are very happy to have those dollars. So it's not that we have to go against the Argentinians also. How can we go against Citibank, the most powerful bank in the, in, the, in the world, probably? We can't. We are too small. We are too weak. So corruption is more than a, a policeman taking $10 just not to, to, not to make you a, a ticket. Corruption has to do with international business at a very high level. Yes. I don't know if I understand very well your question, but I think that the, 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 it's amazing the struggles of the majority of the people have done in order to act, obtain power or to, have, to, to build up a, a better society. And if you have seen in the history of Latin America, hundreds and hundreds of times, people offer their own life to, uh, to obtain, to, to gain power and to build something different. Uh, I can tell you my own generation, I have most of our friends who were killed, offering their lives, probably in, a, in an impossible battle. In an impossible battle, Argentina had the most powerful army in the south of uh, Rio Bravo. 
and the most powerful, with planes, with tanks, with... And nevertheless, many of us f threw themselves against them, and they, uh, we lost, and we lost thousands of friends and thousands of people who were committed to fight. Even the workers, when they go, you know, in Bolivia, we were talking about Bolivia, in the 50s, the miners in Bolivia used to put dynamite in their belts and going against the owners of the, the mines, and they blew up themselves in order to ignite a revolution. That was in the 50s. I, I have, I mean, the people at the Warsaw Ghetto, they raised and they fought against who? Against nothing, just to gain some dignity. They didn't expect to destroy the Nazi, to, to overthrow the Nazi regime, but they wanted to gain respect. There are thousands and thousands. I don't believe that the people do not wake up and do not rise. I think they do it every single day, but sometimes newspapers fail to acknowledge that, that situation. No? I can tell you about uh, tri uh, native tribes in, in Brazil fighting to defend their territories against those people who want to tear down every single tree in the Amazonas. I can, so I don't know. I think that uh, we, and I don't know if we were losing. I think the world is a better place than it used to be many years ago, or many centuries ago, and I think that is uh, because people like Marshall and many other people were pushing and pushing and pushing other people around until their ideas got I mean, on fire and they came up and they, they were accepted by, the, by everybody then. Yeah. I wonder if you can say something about Cuba today. Is that Cuba. An, an example of a country where power well, it's difficult to talk about Cuba here in the United States of America. <laughs> I prefer to talk about Cuba and Cuba because, as you know, there is a, there is a very silly uh, embargo against Cuba who makes every single discussion impossible to because whenever, every time you want to discuss the human rights in Cuba, they say, well, but we have an embargo from the most powerful country in the world, but we have to adopt certain uh, rules and certain uh, measures in order to protect ourselves. I believe that, that Cuba should open more their society. I, I think the Cuban, Cubans should, I mean, open to a more, uh, Op, to, to become a more open society, to have elections, to have different parties, to have a free press. Unfortunately, they think that they don't, that their own way, the, the way they chose, is different. It's a different way. It's a different democracy. Uh, it's not my democracy, but I have to accept that democracy. And nevertheless, like I do in every country in the world, I have signed petitions for the release of every single political prisoner in Cuba, as I do here, as I do in many other countries, in Europe, in Latin America. Every time I see somebody who is in jail for political reasons, I sign. But I don't, I will not buy the theory that, that Cuba is part of the Axis able, able of Axis, or something like that. Yeah? But I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think Cuba has any influence in Latin America whatsoever. Latin America has gone to, it's a much more uh, social democrat country these days. It used to have a big influence, but not now. I think it's not an issue. It's an issue, it's a dom in fact, I think Cuba is a domestic issue. It has to do with the voters in Florida, nothing else. And nothing else to do with geopolitical, nothing. One, one last question, sir. If for a moment you were to look outside uh, the Western Hemisphere and to look for uh, some location, some country or part of the country that is the, the worst situation in your opinion. What would you identify? In, in, in well, <laughs> I guess that wherever you are, if it is a bad situation, that's the worst place, <laughs> wherever. But I think Darfur probably today 
the, in Darfur there is going the genocide is going on. In fact, I think we didn't learn anything, anything. No, you know, we talk about the Holocaust all the time. We keep talking about the Holocaust and we have a a day every year to remember the Holocaust and the wars of ghetto and Auschwitz. And we had a genocide, Rwanda, a few years ago. What's the difference between one and the other? What is the difference between Auschwitz and Darfur? I, I don't know, maybe they have different techniques, but the, the idea, the idea of killing a whole people is the same. And we don't do anything. We are quite calm. The other day I had to talk with the with the human, because of my responsibilities, and we were members of the uh, Security Council at the UN, so I have to receive and the head of the human rights uh, organization, the only human rights organization acting in Darfur. You, you can't believe that he was a, they are human beings, we are human beings, we are here, we are talking, we go out and have coffee, while these people are being Killed is, no, killed is the, the best part of their lives. What happened before being killed is terrible. And so, but I guess that uh, for somebody who has a, a son who is being in jail for many years in, in another part of the world, that's the worst part of the world. But uh, if you ask me, it is their fool. Or maybe the worst part of the world is our part of the world because we can still live without sensing or feeling anything for those people. We are the ones who are fucked up. Thank you very much.